Good afternoon, I'm Christine Taylor Lewis. And on behalf of the AAHA of Fauquier County, I thank you for your support and welcome you to this, our 14th in a series of conversations with family historians and others who share their genealogy research or provide information related to local African-American history. Okay, so our mission at AHA is to collect, document, preserve, and share U.S. history with a focus on African Americans here in Fauquier County. Hopefully these Tuesday Zoom presentations will prompt you to visit our website at aahafauquier.org. There you will find a link to an extensive collection of information available in our database, including photographs, artifacts, and books, as well as links to our archives and variety of ongoing projects. You will also find a virtual tour of our museum and an interactive story map with histories of African-American communities, churches, and schools in Fort Kerr County. There's also a link to news stories and much, much more. So please consider joining us at aaha4care.org. I also want to note that this year marks AAHA's 30th anniversary. So in commemoration, there will be a weekly post on our Facebook page each Thursday to give an overview of some of the agency's various initiatives, programs, and services over time. The theme for these posts will be down through the years, and we invite you to follow us there also. Thank you. Now today's event is unique in that it will be a storytelling presentation. I will read six of the stories from Stanley Brown's blog called Growing Up Colored. The blog contains nearly 50 stories about Stanley's experience growing up in rural Fauquier County in the 1950s and 1960s. As we know, this was a time in Virginia when racial segregation was a way of life. These stories offer a poignant glimpse into what life was like for Stanley. He grew up during a period not only lacking the benefits of equal rights, but also without the advantages of computers, cell phones, ATMs, GPS systems, and other technological conveniences that we enjoy today. I have no doubt that those of us who live in that era will easily relate to at least one of Stanley's many adventures. And for those who did not, I believe these stories will keep you captivated as you learn what life was like at that time. Now I'm going to share a PowerPoint presentation with pictures that relate to Stanley's stories. If you have any questions for Stanley, please enter them in the chat and we will make sure that he receives them. But I think first I should uh, give you an introduction to Stanley. Stanley Brown is a Fauquier native, born in Remington in 1952. His early education began at Piney Ridge Elementary, which was a Rosenwald school in, in Remington. He attended Taylor High School and was transferred to Fauquier High in 1969 during forced integration, and he graduated in 1971. After graduation, he went to Norfolk State College. At the age of 61, he received a degree from DeVry University. Stanley served in the U.S. Navy as an air traffic controller and retired from Lockheed Martin after 35 years of service. He resides in Fredericksburg with his wife, Irene. They have five children, 13 grandchildren, and four great-grands. He loves writing, bird watching, and spending time with his family. I became familiar with Stanley Brown several years ago when I joined a Facebook group called, you're probably from Fort Care if you that, that, that. 
In this group, people submit photos and have general conversations about Fort Care life. It was in this Facebook group where I was introduced to Stanley and his stories. I don't remember what the first story was, but I do remember that I was drawn to it with such a connection that I eagerly looked forward to his next posting. While Stanley is quite a talented and gifted writer, he also is a gentle man and a humble person to the degree that he would rather avoid being in the spotlight. For this reason, I am honored, truly honored to read today from his volume of stories. Shall begin. The first story is a condensed version of Growing Up Colored Everyday Life. It was posted in July 2013 and gives a clear synopsis of what ordinary life was like for Stan when he was a boy. Now the story begins with a recorded version of the following song. Jambo la crowfish pie pile of gumbo. Cause tonight I'm gonna see my chevronio. Pick it tall, feel fruit jar and be gayo. Son of a gun, we'll have big fun on the bayou. Sing it again, Daddy, sing it again. We played it with our father to sing some more. Huh, you wanna hear it again, he asked. Yeah, Daddy, sing it some more. We were yelling by then. Dad started the song from the top again. Goodbye, Joe, me gotta go, me oh my yo. Me gotta go, pull it road down the bio. My Yvonne, the sweetest one, me oh my yo. Son of a gun, gonna have big fun on the bio. Our father didn't sing very often, but he had a really good voice and we loved to listen to him. He liked both kinds of music, country and Western. And that's all he listened to when we were growing up. You can be guaranteed that nine times out of 10, if he was singing in the car, we were probably parked in front of JJ Newberry's department store on East Davis Street in Culpeper waiting for our mother to finish doing her weekly clothes shopping. Or we were in the parking lot of Dr. Walter S. Nicklin's office in Warrington. We sometimes waited for three or four hours for mama to come out of the doctor's office. Back then there were separate waiting rooms for white and colored. Dr. Nicklin's office scheduled appointments so that whites were served mainly during the day and blacks were scheduled in the evenings. Even so, if mom had a seven o'clock appointment and a white person came in without an appointment, my mother would be pushed back so that the white person would be next in line to go in. This was very convenient for those whites who did not like to wait their turn during the day with the other white patients. They could just waltz in anytime after six in the evening and be next in line to see the doctor, no matter how many people were waiting. So many times dad had his hand full trying to keep the six or seven of us under control while mama got herself or one of us checked by the doctor. I always enjoyed Dr. Nicklin's. I'd surveyed the examination room, looking at all of the old photos of him in his army uniform and wondering where each photo had taken place. I believe Dr. Nicklin delivered all of us except by Jean. She was born in my grandmother's house in Remington. According to my mother, Earlene Brown, quote, she was almost not delivered by a doctor. Grandma Brown would not let anyone go get Ellsworth. She sent to town for old Dr. Grant, who lived in the upstairs drugstore building. He was very old and had to walk the one mile from town. He even had to go to town back and forth twice to check on his elderly sister. Barbara was a natural childbirth. But the bottles, because the bottles of ether that Dr. Grant brought in with him was empty. I suffered for years because he did nothing to make sure that I was okay. Dr. Nicklin had a fit when he examined me and the baby. He said, Earlene, I'm sorry to tell you that you will never be able to have any more children, unquote. Famous last words, mama said, I had five more. On Saturdays, we drive to Warrington to pick up the week's mail orders that had arrived at the Sears and Roebuck on Main Street. 
That's Fridays in Culpeper, Virginia, and Saturdays in Warrington. Dad would go to both the AMP and Safeway using a long list of, of uh, sometimes a coupon or two, but mostly he stuck with the deals that he already knew existed through years of experience. The weekly shopping routine had been honed into a science with our parents working as a team to get it all out of the way as quickly and efficiently as possible. They were the shopping version of the weekend warriors. If it had been an Olympic event, our parents would have won a gold medal. We were avid movie go goers, always at the drive-in theater. But the best treat of all was getting all the shopping out of the way and then going to Baby Jim's snack bar, which is still in limited operation on Main Street in Culpeper. They had some of the best hot dogs known to man. Whereas Clayton's on Old Road 29 in Dilton has some of the best fried chicken and potato salad this side of the Rappahannock. Unfortunately, I was not well traveled back in those days and didn't have much experience outside of Rappahannock region. But we did go to Clayton's very often and we gobbled that chicken like it was our last meal on earth. We always made time to go to Glenn's Fair Price store on East Davis Street where we would spend our weekly 25 cent allowance. I could spend the entire day in that store just looking at all the stuff. They had lots and lots of stuff. Looking back, I have come to appreciate how well we were growing up. We received three square meals in a day and always had a snack immediately after school, usually peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and milk. Sometimes we had delicious knuckle sandwich. Knuckle was what we called, what we knew as fake butter, because for many years, we got our butter from Mr. Bowen up the road, but then daddy uh, stopped buying it. And we didn't call it that, we called it by its brand name. There was bologna and cheese or span sandwiches for lunch, and there was no cafeteria at school, so we had the brown bag every day. Almost every Sunday, we'd have steak and eggs and fried potatoes piled with onions for breakfast, or toast and chip beef gravy, that heavy gravy that sticks to your ribs. Sunday dinner was normally fried chicken and potato salad, cabbage, spinach, kale, or some other green vegetable from the garden. But the best meal of all wasn't really a meal at all. On Sunday, on Saturday nights, we were sometimes treated to a sneak preview of Sunday dinner with fried chicken and potato salad. This would be the only time we did not have to sit at the kitchen or dining room table to eat. On Saturday nights, we could bring our plates into the living room and watch Jackie Gleason or Gunsmoke while we ate our late supper. Yeah, there was a lot of love in our family. We stood in line to kiss dad goodbye each morning as he went off to work. And mom kissed us as we left for school each day. We ran out of the house to greet our father when he came home from work. And we were in church every Sunday morning, raining or shine. Growing up caught for those of us who were blessed enough to have been born in Remington, Virginia, wasn't as tough as some have made it out to be. It was a great place to grow up. The end. <laughs> the next story is called Providence and was posted in January 2015. Here, Stan recalls his memories of joining and attending services at the Providence Baptist Church in Remington. I was baptized in the Rappahannock River in the summer of 1961. My older siblings and I, and quite a few of our friends from the Ridge, had turned our lives over to Christ at Providence Baptist Church in Remington, Virginia, only a few weeks earlier. I wasn't even 10 years old at the time and was quite reluctant about going up when the altar call was being made on homecoming revival. I told the much exaggerated story once or twice that I was so scared when my brother and sister tried to talk me into walking up to the altar with them that to help me to make up my mind, one of them pinched me so hard, I jumped up out of my seat. And next thing I knew, I was standing in front of Reverend Tyler. But no matter how I arrived there, I could not turn around. 
not when the matriarch of the church, Miss Cheney, was sitting right there on the aisle seat in the second row, staring at me. I remember Deacon Earl Moore taking me aside and giving me a good talking to. Satisfied by my answers to his questions, if I was ready to accept Christ as my Lord and Savior, he turned to the pastor and nodded his head. And the rest, as they say, is history. The homecoming anniversary of Providence was always one of my favorite memories. Only we didn't call it homecoming when we spoke of it among ourselves. We always called it third Sunday in August. Much of our entire church year revolved around events and activities related to the third Sunday in August. Who was going to speak? Who was going to sing? And most importantly, what foods were going to be served between the morning and evening services? And who was responsible for preparing these dishes? Back then, we didn't have a dining room, so we improvised. There were four or five large oak trees that stood on the pastor's study side of the church. Someone came up with the bright idea to use those trees as the serving area whenever meals were served. Long boards were con constructed and used as tables, and those tables connected all the trees into a circular square. The ladies of the church or the ladies auxiliary worked inside the square, preparing and serving the meals while church members and visitors lined up on the outside waiting to be served with delicious meals. Those meals always included the best fried chicken and potato salad, arguably on the East Coast. Once served, it was every man for himself when it came to finding a prime location to sit and enjoy your meal. Visitors had the luxury or disdain of sitting in their cars, their hot cars, while members usually took time to go home and change clothes for the evening service or freshen up before returning to eat. The ladies of the church spent hours preparing chicken, ham, macaroni and cheese, collard greens, desserts, and much more. While the morning service was in full swing, the women would work feverishly setting up for a dinner. The dinner was a precursor to the afternoon service when a prominent guest speaker and choir that had been advertised um, for weeks in advance would offer old timey gospel songs and a heart throbbing fire and brimstone message that was sure to be talked about for weeks to come. Every one of us, every one of those ladies were great cooks in their own right. Some famous for their potato salad, others for their fried chicken, others for their dessert. Of course, I thought my mother's fried chicken and potato salad was the best on the planet then and now. And I wouldn't want to single anyone out by naming names or by not naming names, but one of my favorite memories is the combination of punch and vanilla wafers provided by Mrs. Ada Hartnett. She brought them to both church and school functions. I would go so far as to brave PTA meetings if I knew that her cookies and punch were going to be served. I've tried, but so far I have been unable to duplicate that childhood delicacy. Many of our lives revolved around Providence back then. I spent many a Wednesday night entertaining myself on a back row pew while the church elders conducted church meetings and many a morning in vacation Bible school during the summer break. Yes, those were the days. I've been back to, I have not been back to the church of my childhood in a while, but I know that Providence Baptist is still going strong, still gathering at the river, and still celebrating third Sunday in August, just as fervently as we did way back in the day. The end. What a heartwarming story. The story about the sit-in of 62 was posted in July 2013 and is a good example of how Fauquier County responded to this particular phase of the civil rights movement. During the summer of the early 1960s, my cousin Robert, Robert Jr. would come down from DC to spend a few weeks with grandma and grandpa Brown. It seemed to me that he was really down to see my brother, baby Ray, as he was called then, 
and would just go back up to their house to sleep in between, staying with us. Robert Jr. is the son of our late Aunt Leora and Uncle Robert Boyd Sr. Everyone always said that he and Raymond looked like brothers. I thought so too. It had become a routine for me and Raymond to walk over town to pick up the mail on Saturdays. And we kept up that practice even while Robert Jr. was visiting. I've always liked to be around Robert Jr. because he seemed to have a lot more freedom than we did. He could come and go as he pleased. And he was always happy to remind us of the fact. Once we started our one mile trek toward Remington, I settled into a leisurely slide, stride and listened intently at the tales of Robert Jr. That he would spin as we made our way down dirt roads and across wooden bridges. He told stories of how he was able to go anywhere, do anything. They really held my attention. And I was awed at the fact that it never got dark in the city because of street lights and that he was allowed to be outside to all hours of the night. We walked, talked, threw rocks, and laughed a lot. We did finally get to Remington, made it to the post office, got the mail, and then got down to the real reason we had come to town in the first place. It was time to go to the Remington drugstore to get an ice cream cone. I'd been to the drugstore on many a Saturday morning, and this day was no different than any other, except that we had him with us. But Raymond and I huddled up next to the soda counter to place our order. There were two other people sitting on the soda counter. So Robert Jr. jumped up on one of the stools and started spinning from side to side in a familiar fashion, although he'd never been in the drugstore before. Raymond got a bewildered look on his face and quickly tugged at Robert Jr.'s shirt. Hey. You got to get down. Robert Jr. didn't really pay any attention, but just asked why, curiously. You just got him, Baby Ray said. He looked intent on getting him off that stool and a bit anxious. We knew there were unwritten rules around Remington. There was just some things you weren't allowed to do. One was never speak to our white buddies while they were with their white friends. And the second was colored people could not sit on the stools at the Remington drugstore soda fountain. Robert Jr. was breaking one of those rules. He didn't have the foggiest idea that blacks weren't allowed to sit at the soda fountain. We lived in two different worlds. This was Main Street, Remington, Virginia, and he was from Benning Road, Washington, D.C., and the two were as different as black and white. Robert Jr. had never encountered racism in his all black world, and he didn't recognize it in ours, but he wasn't getting off of that stool. So the man came to the counter, stared sternly at him, but he only asked, what will you boys have? I was actually shocked that he had made him get down and stand to the side of the counter like we were where we belong. We all got a five cent Vanilla cone. And as we always did, we went outside, sat on the front stoop of the drugstore, and ate cones greedily, talking and laughing. We never talked about the incident again. That was the big sit in of 1962, right about the time the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and the Freedom Riders were trying to win the right to sit at lunch counters all over the South. I like to think that the equal rights movement came to Remington that day and that we quote, overcame unquote, for just a while. He may not have made a big difference, but I do believe that by being able to share this story with my family, Robert Jr.'s sit-in of 62 will live on through the generations, the end. So first, I want to thank the attendees for attending today and joining us for these stories. And I certainly hope that you have enjoyed them as much as I enjoyed reading them. So at this time, I'll check the chat for any possible questions or comments. And remember that Stanley welcomes your questions or comments by way of his email on the chat screen. 
And if there are questions that I can answer, I will do that. Okay, so far I don't see any chat questions. Okay. So what I'll do at this time is uh, return to telling these wonderful stories. If I can do that. The next two stories are interrelated. The first is called the State Bank of Remington, Up Close and Personal. It was posted in August, 2013 and has a Mayberry IFD flavor. The second is called Miracle of the Corn and was posted in March of 2014. The State Bank of Rivington, Up Close and Personal. After I graduated high school, my father decided that it was time for me to have a car of my own. Prior to this, I only mentioned wanting to own a car once, but I had mentioned wanting to learn to drive several times. Buddy Hayes, a friend and neighbor, took the task of teaching me to drive from time to time when I was about 16. Blinky, as he is known throughout Remington, had me sit behind the wheel of his car with a wide open field in front of me and told me what to do. It wasn't long before I was kicking up dirt, up and down the dirt road that we lived on, shifting a straight stick like an old pro. Thanks, buddy. When it came time to purchase a car, dad took me to Alexandria Pike in Warrington and turned into Arrington Motors. At the time, I couldn't have predicted that my mother, Earlene, would become very good friends with Mrs. Arrington and be a caregiver for her mother for many years to come. Unfortunately, at the time, Mr. Arrington's prices were well beyond my budget. So we decided to try a place on the bypass on East Shirley Highway just up and across from where the new Warrington Fire Station sits today. I found a black 1962 Ford Falcon for $250. I paid cash for it and basically parked it in the driveway because I had been accepted to attend Norfolk State College. I went off to college and when I returned home to, for Christmas break, I wrecked my car simply because I was out of practice driving. The next year, I decided it was time for another vehicle. And I walked to Remington Bank after picking out a 1965 Ford Mustang for $500. When I got to the bank, I went up to the teller and told her that I was there for a car loan. She directed me to Mr. William Embry's desk, the president of the bank. To this day, I have never met a president of any other bank that I've been a member of. I sat down when he said, so you're here for a car loan? Yes, sir. You're Ellsworth Brown's boy, right? Yes, sir. He's a good man. Let's see. Fine. We can give you a loan. He reached over, shook my hand and said, wait here for just a moment. He left, came back a few minutes later with a bank book with a loan amount handwritten on it and a check for $500. Bring it by and let me take a look at it. That was it. I didn't sign a single document, never saw a loan agreement. I bought the car and drove it by the bank to let Mr. Embry have a look at it. I stopped by the bank every month with my loan book to make the payments. I watched the loan amount slowly dwindle away over the course of three years. That's right, I received a car loan from the president of the bank, William Embry with only a firm handshake and a binding contract. After owning the Mustang for a few years and a few other cars, I allowed someone to convince me that it wasn't proper for a respectable young lady to be seen riding in a custom van with drapes and full-size bed in the back, and that I should get a new car, more befitting of a lady of her station. Well, guess what? I went out and bought a really nice car. Yes, I bought a really nice car that I could not possibly afford to own. It didn't take very long for me to discover this fact 
And after only two monthly payments to the Bilton branch of the bank, I called the loan officer who had given me the loan. We'll call him Mr. Hand and explained to him that I needed to return the car to the bank because I couldn't make the monthly payments. Mr. Hand didn't see it that way, of course. You're making payments on time every month, so there's really nothing I can do. My hands are tied. This back and forth went on for a few months, me calling and asking him to come to get the car, and him saying he couldn't as long as I was making the payments. I actually begged him to come to get the car. I explained that although I was paying for the car, I was behind on my rent and one or the other would have to be dropped. And since I had to live somewhere, the car had to go, but he did not budge. That's when I decided to simply stop paying for the car. I just stopped. Two months of non-payments went by and sure enough, Mr. Ham began calling on a regular basis, threatening to repossess the car as if I didn't immediately begin to make payments again. He screamed into the phone. I'm coming over there personally, tow your car if you don't stop making payments. My immediate reaction was, isn't that what I've been trying to ask you to do for the past six months? I've been begging you to come get this car. You start making payments or you never get another car from this bank again. He was extremely upset, but there was nothing I could do. My hands were tied. A week later, I removed the tires, put them inside the car and in the trunk along with the keys. I put the car up on blocks in the apartment parking lot, called Mr. Ham and told him where he could pick it up. I packed, moved to Richmond with my sister and her husband at their behest. After three months of living in Richmond, I grew tired of the city life and left a good job. My lovely sister, her husband and the family they were starting and moved back to Fauquier County. I quickly found a new job in a new apartment. The only thing was lacking was a car. I needed to catch a ride to work every day and I hated relying on someone else for transportation. One day out of the blue, I received a phone call. Hello, Stanley. This is Gloria Coma of the State Bank of Remington. I hear you're in need of a car. Mrs. Coma, VP of the State Bank of Remington? I wondered, how in the world is she here that I needed a car? But she went on, why don't you come by and let's talk about it. But Ms. Coleman, the loan officer over there, Mr. Hand, he said I'd never get another car loan. Well, I'm not Mr. Hand. Come on by. I think we, we can work something out. I dropped everything, shot over there as fast as I could run around. And lo and behold, she told me, pick out a car. Bring her by to let me look at it. Yes, they still made you bring the car by so they could look it over back then. And before you knew it, I owned a new car. Back then, everybody knew everybody. And more importantly, everybody knew everybody's business. Someone had to have tipped off Mrs. Coma that I needed a car. But to this day, I don't know who that someone was. Not only did I pay off that loan, I finished paying off the loan for the car I'd left behind. That is the couple of hundred dollars difference between what I owed on the car and the amount they sold it for after they repoed it. Mrs. Coma didn't have to do that. She went out of her way to contact me, to reach out to me when I was in need. And I greatly thank her for that. And Mr. Embry, he gave me a car loan solely on, solely on the basis of knowing and respecting my father, Ellsworth Doc Brown. As you all may know, some years later, the prominent bank president and community leader ran into some legal trouble. That is not what this story is about. This, is, this story is about people who afforded me and others in the community opportunities that we may not have otherwise been able or been open to if they had not been there for us. Had this happened today, his next move might be to run for public office. And by his popularity, I have no doubt that he would win. The end of this wonderful story. Miracle of the Corn. Remember that Ford Falcon I told you about in the State Bank of Remington story that I posted in 2013? 
You do? Well, there's another story that goes hand in hand with that one. Here it is. As soon as I got my driver's license and bought a car, my mother decided that she too should learn to drive. Knowing that dad didn't have a lot of patience when it came to teaching something to someone that he felt should, that it should come natural to them, my mother turned to our neighbor across the field, Buddy Hayes. You may know him around town as Blinky. He told, taught both my mother and me how to drive a straight stick. He would let us drive up and down that old dirt road we lived on to our heart's content. He was very patient and he let you make mistakes without being judgmental, a virtue that not, not many of us possess. After mom received all the training she felt she needed from Buddy, she decided it was time to give her experience a real test. She wanted to take my car out on the pavement, down some of that road and beyond. Once we started, mom did real well. I was in the passenger seat and my younger brother, Michael, was just along for the ride and he was in the back seat. Summer Duck Road number, I mean, Route 651 was a breeze. She did everything right. We turned on Savannah Branch Road number 751 and still things went smoothly. So this is where the controversy begins and our collective memories of what happened next parted ways. I decided to have her turn on Morgansburg Road, 653. It runs along the Ott Farm. Yes, the same farm mentioned in the story, The Long Way Home. Mom says I waited too late to tell her to turn. I think I gave her adequate notice that said notice abided with the strict queen standard protocol for blurting out driving instructions. We will have to agree to disagree on this matter for there is no documented evidence or video footage that can cite as a valid and reliable source at this, at this late date. All I know is the, no matter who was to blame, the car veered too late to make the turn and the steering was overcorrected to the point that the car ended up in the ditch. I apologize for all the legal mumbo jumbo, but one must say, or must be very careful when recounting disputed accounts and recollections, especially in cases yet to be settled. But I will yield to my mother's version out of respect and the fact that she may knock me upside the head if I don't. The next thing I know, we were sitting cockeyed in the ditch, teetering precariously to the left. I immediately jumped out of the passenger side door, flailing my arms, above my head yelling, my car, my car, what have you done to my car? I was completely in shock and adrift of my senses as I circled the car, searching through the imagined wreckage, looking to assess the damage. The car had not a scratch on it. At, the point, at that point, my little brother decided that he too should go into panic mode and he began crying uncontrollably. It was summer, the windows were drawn, so I stuck my head in the back window and yelled, shut up, you're not hurt, my car, my car, look at my car. All of a sudden, the ocean of corn parted majestically a la Red Sea. A light appeared in its mist and descended down upon us. Was it an hallucination brought on by a concussion? Was it an angel from on high? No, it was none of these. It was Mr. Art on his tractor. That was old Mr. Art, not to be confused with the young Mr. Art, the Mr. Art who, from my perspective at the time, owned a farm on the scale of the Panderosa Ranch on the TV show Bonanza, that Mr. Art. The Mr. Art that my father had worked for milking cows when he was only 12 or 13 years old, that Mr. Khan, art. But to me, what I saw was a guardian angel. He stopped on his side of the fence with a tractor still puttering and asked if we needed help. He said he brought a chain with him so he could pull us from the miry clay 
to wrest us from death's impending grip. He and his tractor pulled the car out of the ditch. We were saved. Afterwards, we talked. He knew who we were, asked how my dad was doing, and refused to accept any payment for his very kind deed. He drove off into the sunset the same way he had arrived. As soon as we returned home, we told dad what had transpired, the miracle of the corn, as it had come to be done. Dad immediately went outside, got in his car, and drove down to the Ott farm to thank Mr. Ott for helping us. And indeed, it was a miracle as far as I'm concerned, and something that has stayed with me to this day, for miracles do happen. Eventually, Mom went on to get her driver's license and she bought her first car, which was a 1961 Ford Falcon. Her car was almost identical to mine, except that her car was white. End of the story. The last story, thinking about Mama, was posted in July of 2017 and is self-explanatory. It's two o'clock on Sunday afternoon, and I'm sitting in my living room, watching an old Western on TV. I leaned back in my chair and peeked over into the kitchen. No one was there. There were no smells emanating from the direction that would indicate that food was being prepared. And it wasn't very likely that there would be anytime soon. My immediate reaction was to think to myself, when I was growing up, mama would have already had the table set and would be calling us to Sunday dinner. And immediately after that, the realization set in that those days were long over. In our house now, home cooked Sunday dinners are mostly for special occasions. Families don't sit down to dinner much anymore. If they do, they aren't talking about it. When my siblings and I were growing up, we received two home-cooked meals a day, breakfast and supper, plus a bagged lunch to take to school, and a snack, usually in the form of peanut butter or bologna and cheese. And this happened after school. As I recall those days, it dawned on me how much went into feeding, clothing, and raising seven children. The majority of that effort came from my mother. I'd never realized until then how much work really went into taking care of us. Dad definitely did his part. He brought home the bacon and met it out the real discipline when he had to. Sure, mom kept us straight, but when things happened that required a stronger hand, she turned us over to our father. I seriously don't know how they were able to raise us all on a single income. My wife and I both worked, and we still were just able to feed and clothe our kids and put them through college. My wife worked her fingers to the bone outside the home, then come, came home every evening and cooked, cleaned, and took care of our five kids. I don't know how she did it, but our kids are all grown now with lives and families of their own. I think we did okay. It was a team effort, but like most two-part households, moms did most of the heavy lifting when it came to rearing the family. That's off to mothers. You do so much for so little. Your real reward is watching your children grow up and become responsible adults. Nowadays, there aren't very many stay-at-home moms, but the moms, they are moms nonetheless. They are loving, caring, supportive, and nurturing. And we are all blessed because of them. So hats off to mothers, you've done well. Don't take your mother for granted. I lost my mom just over a month ago and my sister, Marcia, one week ago today. I surely do miss them. Mom took much pride in her children. I hope I continue to make her proud. I turned off the TV got up out of my easy chair, went to the kitchen 
made myself a bowl of cereal and smiled and thought about mama. That's the end of the story. And this concludes today's reading of just a few stories from Stan's blog called Growing Up Color. I hope you, I truly hope that you enjoy them just as much as I enjoyed reading them. Stan's blog can, blog can be found at growingupcolored.com. That's growing-up-colored.com. There you will find nearly 50 stories recalling Stanley's days as a young boy and later as a grown man navigating his way through the societal challenges of his time. While he takes us back to a loving and secure home environment, as well as a strong, closely knit African-American community and a friendly white community, he does not avoid the historical significance of race relations, both good and bad. One story that comes to mind for me, which I didn't read because it's a little lengthy for this one, maybe I could have gotten it in, but it's called Nothing to Cheer About. And it talks about the desegregation of the Fort Care County Schools in 1969. It's very detailed and witty, but a serious recollection of the 1969 cheerleader setting. There actually was a cheerleader set in, and it's a great story and also an inside view of what happened then. And it says a lot about how um, the administration at that time um, took care of matters that were going on. But I would urge you and encourage you to go to um, Stanley's blog, blog, growingupcolored.com. Again, he will welcome any comments or questions that I sent to his address or his email address at um, circle D at msn.com. It's on the screen and it's also in the chat room. Can you hear me? Okay. So I'm going to the chat room to see what's there and to read some of the comments. And again, um, if there's something that Stan needs to answer directly, um, please direct your question to his um, email address. Okay, thanks. So my cousin and I were the first to attend Marshall Elementary School, and our experience was not good. Angel Carter, Robert Christian, and Brenda Chen. My first memory is having all the white children throw rocks at me as I stood along the side of the building until someone made them stop. I was five or six. The next thing I recall is being beaten with a paddle until I wet my clothes. Worst of all, the white children would not play with us and the black families at our church said we thought we were too, poor, too good to attend Northwestern. So many people stopped speaking to our family and the children were not allowed to play with us either. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, this is a very distressing view of what went on back then. But during the time of segregation, it was legal under the law. Um, these things and things that even worse happened but we are thankful that we did go through the civil rights era where leaders such as Dr. Martin Luther King and others um, um, spoke out and, and marched and, and gave us a um, voice. And some things have been able to change and there are still some things that we need to work on even today. But um, I thank you very much for your comment and for sharing that. They were awful memories. So sorry it happened. Someone responded. Great stories. We'll have to check out this blog. Thank you for sharing. I'm glad, Tina, that you will check it out. They're great stories. It's almost 50 of them. And uh, they're all interesting. They all have their own personality. Uh, some of them were uh, about when he was in school. It's very historical. There's uh, information about the Rosenwald schools because he did attend a, a Rosenwald school at Piney Ridge. And uh, there's information uh, about uh, this in detail about the period of um, segregation or, or integration into Fort Care High and in Fort Care County. 
And as his experience was at the sit-in with uh, little Junior, <laughs> and Warrington, I think I was like 14 or 15 years old when they, Eva Walker and uh, Mrs. Murray Blakely and some others went to Ben and Mary's Steakhouse and sat down. So we went up to Rhodes Drugstore and where we normally would have to stand behind the counter, I would buy some golden ice cream blues. Then we just sat up on the stool and no one said anything, they just went on and served us. So perhaps the man who served to you and uh, Stan and Junior got the word that things were going to change. But uh, that was a delightful story. And thank you so much. Could you repeat the blog address? The blog address is growing dash up dash colored dot com. G-R-O-W-I-N-G dash U-P dash C-O-L-O-R-E-D dash com. Charlie Brown says she enjoyed Stanley. Oh. Angela Davis says, could you repeat the blog? We did that. Okay, uh, Kristen, to everyone, she enjoyed the stories. They're funny and heartwarming. Okay, um, our own Jerry Williams, our tech guy, has listed the, um, the address so that you can click into that and go to the blog. Michael said, nice stories. My attorney has advised against further comment. <laughs> Michael's the one to start crying. It was funny. I really, really enjoyed reading these stories. It's so hot one. There was a story about him when he was uh, standing, when he was in the service. And uh, he was stationed in North Carolina, I think it was. And he was sitting, a uh, friend asked him to let's go out and do something because he was a control tower person. Um, he just needed that break. So he went to this club and he saw this woman across the road. And she looked pretty neat. And so he asked her to dance. And before you know it, they got up on the floor and he said he felt like he was on Soul Train somewhere. And they were dancing and dancing and dancing. It's a delightful story. And I, I don't want to um, tell you the end, but uh, you should go on the blog and read about it. It's, it was really funny. And I can imagine him back then. <laughs> and so some of the times back then, they weren't all miserable to many of us. But there was that constant awareness of race relations. There was no way to get past it. We were aware that we were African-Americans, that we were colored or Negroes back then all the time because we would go into the setting with um, the majority race and uh, we would be reminded of those things. And things have gotten better, but we still have some work to do. So we thank you, Stanley, so, so very much for sharing your stories. Uh, first of all, for writing them and uh, then for sharing them. And on behalf of the Afro-American Historical Association of Fort Care, I thank you so much for allowing me to tell a few. And uh, perhaps we'll be able to do that again. Now, next month, we will focus on books and authors here on this uh, Zoom event on Tuesdays. On Tuesday, August 5th, from 1 to 2 p.m., we will talk to Takesha Payne, who writes children's books. And her books are all over. Uh, I've seen them uh, in various places within Warrington, bookstores, Walmart, all over. And of course, they're on Amazon. And during the same setting, uh, we will talk to Ashley Webb, who does illustrations for children's books. And Ashley Webb is the niece of uh, Sherry Carter. I mean, actually she's Sherry's daughter and Sherry's stuff. So I think she gets a gift um, naturally. But she and uh, Takesha Payne will be here on Tuesday, August 5th and talk about children's books as authors and as illustrators. So I hope that you'll come back and join us then. And then on August 23rd, two weeks later, we will talk to Pamela Swan Rennick, who wrote a book entitled Experiencing Death and the Growth from It. And it's a, a good book, uh, very thought provoking, penetrating. Um, she's a minister of the gospel and uh, she talks about her experience uh, with dealing with death with uh, family mothers, I mean, members, including a mother. 
and um, how she was able to grow from that experience or those experiences. And along with um, Pamela will be Lorraine Jones Whitfield, my cousin. And she has published a series of journals and devotionals about building faith. So on the 23rd of August, both of them will be here to talk about their publications. So we do thank you again for joining us. And we hope that you will come back on August 5th and again on August the 23rd as we continue this series of um, Zooms related to African-American history and the Black experience here in Fauquier County. So thank you very much, and I will leave the screen.